the, uh, the BAR, as everyone knows, is uh, Board of Architectural Review in Charleston. It's been in existence since 1931, and it's actually the first uh, board in the country uh, devoted to, uh, to preservation. So it's a distinctive aspect of Charleston. Um, there are different uh, uh, areas of the city, historic areas of the city, uh, as illustrated by this map. Um, the old and historic district shown here in purple is the oldest historic district. It actually began quite small down in the, uh, the Battery area here and has expanded over time. Uh, up uh, some of the primary uh, streets, Meeting Street, King Street, and so forth. Um, and if your project is in that area, it is subject to the most restrictive uh, regulations from the Board of Architectural Review. Uh, all demolitions in, in this area need to be approved by the Board. All new construction and anything that is visible from the public right of way or the street is subject to purview. Uh, the old city district shown in the sort of tan color here, uh, the old city lower district, um, the regulations change a little bit. Uh, if a building is um, greater than 50 years of age, it is subject to demolition approval by the board. So, you know, down here, any demolition here, the building has to be 50 years or older. Uh, again, all new construction, and then alterations to existing buildings that are over 100 years of, of age. So a little, bit, a little bit different regulations in these two areas, but they're both historic areas. And then finally, this sort of mustard color up here is the old city upper. And again, any buildings 50 years or older require uh, approval by the board for demolition. Uh, the distinction in this area is um, the board only has purview over new construction of commercial or multi-family of eight units or more. Obviously, churches would, would fall in the category of commercial, so there would be uh, purview there. Um, and then alterations to commercial or multi-family units, eight and, eight and more. Um, Demolitions of buildings 50 years or older anywhere south of Mount Pleasant Street are subject to, uh, um, but outside the old city district are subject to purview review as well. And then finally, there are some landmark overlay properties in the city like McLeod Plantation, uh, Charlestown Landing, uh, Enston Homes on Upper King Street, Drake Hall. These are landmark buildings in the city and any demolition, alterations, or new construction regardless of visibility, so it's all sides of the building in this case, are subject to purview. No interior work is subject to purview of the BAR at all, simply uh, building code compliance. We put together, uh, our, my staff put together this uh, sort of cheat sheet, if you will, that sort of explains all of what I talked about and the colors correspond to the map. And it basically says if you're in the old historic district, this is, you know, the regulations that you have to abide to. Uh, conversely, uh, the uh, old city upper and lower and then landmark. So it's a flow chart that sort of explains just what I mentioned previously. Um, in terms of uh, projects that go to the board and who the board is, um, the Board of Architectural Review uh, reviews all alterations to significant buildings. So that, that cannot be approved at a staff level. Uh, in addition to that, any new construction in the historic districts, any additions, significant additions, and any demolitions. And they're required to visit the property uh, that is being proposed for demolition the day of the meeting. Um, the board is comprised of seven, seven citizen members. Um, we've got, at this point, we've got three attorneys, uh, two architects, a structural engineer, and a landscape architect. So it's a pretty uh, good professional group uh, that are, you know, 
people who are highly qualified to review the projects. The meetings are held twice a month, second and fourth Wednesday of each month, and there's a submission deadline a week before, and, and we've got specific requirements I'll talk about in a little bit in terms of what needs to be submitted in advance of uh, being on the agenda for the board. And it's a, it's a public meeting, and the purpose of that is to allow citizens and neighbors and, and interested parties and preservation groups to attend the meeting and speak out in support or in opposition to the project or to offer their thoughts on, on the project in general. But it's an important uh, process to, uh, to promote that, that interaction. Um, Staff actually reviews about 80, 85 to 90 percent of all projects that are submitted. So we really do handle most of the projects. And those types of projects are sort of minor additions, signage, uh, hardscaping, things like fences and walls and paving. Uh, the BAR does not have purview over landscaping, however, so we do not review landscaping. But mechanical equipment, you know, equipment that's on the uh, raised pedestals for flood uh, compliance and so forth, repairs, what we call rot repair. Um, and these, these reviews get publicized on the website, uh, and they also get posted on the property. I'm sure everybody's seen these blue stickers in windows of projects that are currently approved by the, by the BAR, and um, you're required to post that in the window to demonstrate that it has been approved is compliant. Um, there are three phases of a typical BAR review, conceptual, preliminary, and final. And the uh, conceptual review is really for the review of the general height scale, mass, three-dimensional form, and the general architectural direction of the project. You know, this is where you get into sort of how the project relates to the surrounding buildings and, and you know, the, the neighborhood in general in terms of its height, scale, and mass primarily, but also the architectural direction. Is it an appropriate uh, architectural direction for the location of the project? After that, um, the next level of review is a preliminary review, and this is where you start to get into development of the uh, conceptual design in more detail. We talk about materials and finishes and the level of quality of the project. Um, for smaller projects, uh, oftentimes the board will review smaller projects at a conceptual level, and if they're really satisfied with the direction of the project, they'll turn it over to staff and say, final review by staff. And what that means is you're done with the board. You're now dealing with staff to uh, develop the project and, and, and detail drawings. And then finally, final review is the a review of the completion of the preliminary phase. This is really the construction documents for the project. Those documents that are given to the contractor to uh, construct the project. So it's all the details, all the materials clearly identified. And that's really important because we do look at, at the details. We're not just concerned with the overall sort of height, scale, and mass and direction of the project, but we really are looking at details. You know, we feel the BAR staff feels like it's our job to really try to uh, ensure the quality of projects, both from a, from a design point of view, from a materials point of view, and from a construction point of view. So we're looking at these documents. We come out at the end of a project and do a final review. We might come out during the project, depending upon the size of the project, obviously. Some of your larger um, you know, projects get a little more attention than, say, some smaller projects, but we're there at various stages and we do have to sign off on the final certificate of occupancy uh, for the project. Um, in terms of requirements for submission, uh, at the conceptual stage, you need to submit existing and proposed site plan for the project, floor plans of, of what is being proposed, elevation drawings and streetscape drawings, and I'll talk a little bit more about what streetscape drawings mean. And then photos of the existing building. This is all so that when the presentation is made at the board meeting, uh, there's a comprehensive presentation of what the project is about, 
and the context in which it is located. Um, as you progress to the, the more detailed phases of preliminary and final, the requirements become a little bit more um, uh, broad. Uh, you know, preliminary requirements, for instance, are the same as conceptual, what's outlined for conceptual up there. Uh, and then we add the requirement for wall sections and materials, as I mentioned, cut sheets and materials and samples of materials. So it's important on a, on a larger project to involve a professional uh, design team to guide you through this process because they understand what we're looking for, especially the local architects who deal with BAR on an ongoing basis. Um, they know what we're looking for and they understand what needs to be provided at these various phases. And then as I mentioned, at the final stage we're looking for sort of construction documents and details and you know, more detailed information about lighting and, and finishes and, and signage and so forth. Um, an example of perhaps um, a drawing that might get submitted at a conceptual phase are these drawings. And you know, this is an example of an apartment complex um, actually off the peninsula, but um, you know, it's sort of an overview of what the building is going to look like and then some, some enlarged details with notes, but that's about detailed elevations, I should say. Uh, with some notes, but that's about the extent of uh, the level of information. Oftentimes on larger projects, the board will require a model or some three-dimensional uh, rendered images uh, of the project to, to really understand the uh, scope of the project and the nature of the uh, design. Um, but we're talking really about building envelope here, if, if you will. Um, streetscape drawings I mentioned previously uh, these are drawings, and oftentimes you'll see applicants put together sort of a montage of photographs of, of the houses or, or buildings, um, if it's commercial buildings, on the street, and then sort of drop in their, their project in that streetscape to show sort of, okay, we're, we're talking about something here that is relatively well related to its, its neighbors and the streetscape. That's important to understand how the project relates. Um, <clears throat> these are detail, more detailed drawings that show up at the preliminary stage. So now we're starting to talk about how the, the, the walls are put together, what the materials are, some of the details are starting to emerge here to really understand the, the quality of the project <clears throat> and to show the sort of parts working together. And then here's an example of sort of final documentation. So now we've got schedules about doors and windows and we've got you know inf more technical information about doors and windows and, and lighting and, and you know just the as I mentioned sort of the construction document information that the contractor will need in order to construct the building. <clears throat> I want to transition a little bit away from the process and talk about some of the projects that we've seen some of the issues that confront churches that we see over and over, and ways that we've been able to help some churches um, get from point A to point B in terms of uh, an appropriate approval for their project. Um, some of the issues that we see repeating are issues of handicap access, you know, ramps, and how to do that on historic buildings appropriately. Uh, issues of roofing, you know, there's an issue right now uh, that many people know about. Um, one of the men, the really the manufacturer of what's called turn metal uh, roofing, which is the roof that you see throughout Charleston. It's sort of a hand fashioned uh, metal roof um, that one particular manufacturer went out of business and sold their equipment to another manufacturer. And there's been delays in getting the product, and they're actually not going to make the, the product that is most. Uh, prominent in Charleston. So we've been scrambling, talking with manufacturers. There are some options, but it is an issue right now that we hope will get resolved soon as the manufacturer gets up to speed. Windows and doors, stained glass, how to protect stained glass. This is something we see a lot uh, with respect to churches. Ongoing maintenance, deferred maintenance uh, that 
oftentimes creates issues. I'll show you one particular project where that was a, a big factor. Painting buildings, coatings, what's appropriate, what isn't appropriate. These are things that, you know, if we meet early, we can talk about. And many of the uh, designers in the community understand what's appropriate and what isn't. But, um, you know, there are some things that are appropriate for historic buildings and, and some products that are not. And we have a pretty good handle on that so we can help guide you. And then finally, parking. That's one of the biggest issues we see with churches. You know, how can we provide more parking for our downtown church so that we can, you know, support people commuting into the city from outside of the city on the weekend. Um, this project, this is Church of the Holy Communion on Ashley Avenue, and I went out and met with uh, uh, a representative of the uh, church and talked about uh, they wanted to, they had some problems with roof leaks, they got a flat roof, and they wanted to see what they could do to this historic building to rectify that. And it was this uh, section of the, of the church here um, and what we came, I actually uh, met with them and came up with an idea to create a, a low pitch roof that would not be visible from the street uh, and would actually allow the water to run off and to feed into some scuppers uh, because they were originally talking about doing sort of a gable form, which would be a difficult thing to do in this particular uh, complex of buildings. Um, this is the circular congregational church. Um, they wanted to uh, replace uh, some windows on the building, uh, but also protect some, some stained glass windows. Um, there was water damage to uh, some of the stained glass windows in the sanctuary and clear glass windows in the parish hall, both historic. Um, and the parish hall windows were uh, removed, repaired, and reinstalled. And I'll talk a little bit later about the sort of national preservation standards, but, you know, saving the existing uh, historic uh, fabric is the number one priority from a preservation point of view. If you can, if you can take an old window out and repair it, and there are, you know, some really successful ways of repairing rotted wood, uh, and, and refurbish the, the window and put it back together, and have it function and be, you know, uh, fairly energy efficient, that's preferred over replacing the windows, even if they're identical to the original window. Uh, so here the, 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 uh, the task was to uh, protect the stained glass, and we worked with uh, one of the manufacturers of a custom product that they installed here to uh, protect the stained glass. The sash of these storm windows, if you will, um, are ventilated so that you, know, you don't get condensation on the stained glass um, and the frames exactly match the profile of the existing stained glass so it's a pretty non-invasive way of protecting stained glass. Um, this is another church, St. Mark's uh, on Thomas Street, same issue, protect the stained glass. They had in the past done some sort of uh, less than effective ways of, of achieving that. And so you had a number of different conditions here where you have several uh, struck, you know, members in the stained glass uh, storm window and here less, a less number of members. So it was really kind of a hodgepodge. And we worked with them to develop a system similar to what was done on the circular church. Um, we recommended repair of the existing sash and replacement of the colored glass with clear glass, and then locating new uh, stained glass windows on the interior of the existing windows because they wanted to add stained glass to the church. They had sort of colored glass previously. So the stained glass went on the interior of the historic windows. The historic windows essentially became storm windows for the, for the stained glass in this, in this case. Uh, we also recommended um, some uh, suggestions about keeping the building colors white and, and making some repairs. And all of that uh, advice ultimately um, allowed them to get approval from the board and the work was done. Um, these are just some other images. 
uh, Emmanuel AME Church on Calhoun Street. Uh, this is an example of a church that uh, wanted to uh, provide for handicap access, obviously a very challenging uh, uh, access issue for handicapped people to the sanctuary of the church. Um, and we worked with the architects to develop a scheme that has been to and approved by the board, uh, but a, an elevator tower essentially disengaged from the building connected in what we call sort of hyphen fashion, and that is sort of a connection, a more tenuous connection to connect the, the elevator tower to the existing building to try to minimize the impact on the historic uh, quality of the church with this addition. And so the design of this evolved into something that is pretty sympathetic with the uh, existing church building. It, it, it would not be a good thing to um, sort of duplicate any, any features of the church uh, from a preservation standpoint. One of the tenets of preservation design is, is not duplicating and recreating history, but doing something that is sympathetic and sort of, you know, makes reference to uh, some of the details of the church without being, um, without copying. Uh, this uh, is another church project that uh, we worked with the architect on, on the, the doors of the church, which were uh, structurally failing and sagging and had some, some issues. Um, and then uh, the Cathedral of St. John, uh, this is a project where uh, they had actually done quite a bit of work um, on, on the, uh, you know, the building itself. And, and adding the, uh, the steeple and so forth um, in recent years, but they hadn't really done much to the, the grounds of the, pro of the uh, church, and they wanted to create a prayer garden. Um, so we assisted the architect with the layout of that, and the uh, design of that early on, um, and these are uh, some images um, of drawings that were submitted as part of their application to the board. And it was approved and is uh, apparently uh, in the fundraising phase of trying to make this happen. Um, and then finally, I mentioned deferred maintenance. St. St. Matthew's Lutheran Church on King Street. Um, there were some early repairs on this building, some, some poor repairs that resulted in several million dollars worth of problems uh, to the building. Um, they, they applied some elastic, elastomeric uh, coatings over the stucco building that, you know, it, it basically creates a sort of a plastic shield, if you will, on the building. It's great for keeping water out, but once water gets in, it can't get out. And so it basically just, you know, delaminates the, uh, the coating from the building. And this happened throughout the building. So they undertook a, a, a fundraising campaign and they raised the funds and they're, they're going to uh, begin fairly soon with uh, the repairs to the building. They're, they're doing a small addition, they're doing some lighting uh, changes to accentuate features of the building uh, and, and basically instituting some long-term repairs uh, that are more appropriate for a building, a historic building of, of this caliber. And a lot of churches have um, schools and uh, you know other buildings associated with them. Uh, this is the first Baptist church school, um, which um, you know, a lot of these buildings are usually housed in separate buildings on the grounds. Uh, this building caught fire in, in March of 2012, and it was pretty badly damaged. So we work with the school administration and the and the architects and design professionals for the project to sort of help them develop the best course of action uh, for their master plan for really the whole campus and began with this particular building. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and, and these are images of that building prior to any renovations after the fire. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Handicap access, uh, it's a recurring issue that churches face and how to deal with aging congregations. Um, 
and many, you know, the, the need to provide uh, access for wheelchairs and, and uh, people with disabilities who can't negotiate steps. And we're talking about historic buildings oftentimes, so it's a, a real difficult challenge. Uh, I met on site with the pastor and, and the design professional for the church, and we talked about the best way to install a ramp on the project while respecting uh, the building's historic character. Uh, this is what was approved by the Board of Architecture Review. What's interesting about this is uh, the final design shows a, uh, you know, a, a handrail design here with just a simple curb uh, at the edge of the ramp. Initially, the, the applicant uh, wanted to do sort of a stucco wall that was as high as the top of the, uh, the railing, and that just felt a little heavy-handed for this wood frame. So we, we talked about that and, um, and decided that the best approach would be this approach. There are some other aspects, details of this that sort of differentiated from the existing building so that you clearly know that this is not original to the building, but it's necessary in order for um, parishioners to uh, attend services and gain access. Um, same thing here for the uh, French Huguenot Church. Obviously, you know, much more significant um, architectural example. But uh, again, you know, a sympathetic um, railing and ramp system that had as probably as least impact on the building as as could have been um, undertaken. Um, the, the ramp, the entrance from the top of the ramp into the building goes through a former window, so there wasn't as much removal of historic fabric as perhaps it would have been had it gone through a solid portion of the wall. Uh, the ramp has, has piers below it, which uh, rather than a solid foundation, so that there's minimal impact on the, uh, on the grave sites. Um, the simple railing here doesn't compete with the uh, with the historic wrought iron fence in front of the building and along the side. And, uh, and they also did some repairs to the steps at the front here. Uh, they were fairly dangerous and this railing was, was moving around pretty good. Uh, actually replaced some and repaired some brownstone treads at the entrance to the building. Um, and maybe the most, the best example of the least impact on a historic building in terms of ramp systems, if you have the, the room on your on your site, is to do a ramp that is um, one in twenty, meaning you know for every twenty inches in length of the ramp, it, it doesn't exceed one inch in height, and that allows you by the building code and, and the American with Disabilities Act to do a ramp that doesn't require any hand. Sidewalk essentially that has obviously the least visual impact on the building, and if it can be done, it's it's the usually the best approach. Um, but it does require having space because it takes up a fair amount of room in plan. Uh, what I'd like to talk about finally here is the Secretary of the Interior's uh, standards um, that <coughs> pertain to all preservation throughout the country, really. Um, the standards were developed by the National Park Service uh, back in the 70s to provide guidance for evaluating uh, tax credit projects, actually. Um, and it's, these are the nationally accepted standards of preservation uh, used at every level of government, federal, state, local level. Charleston um, adopted the Charleston standards um, in uh, 2008. And they're modeled after the, uh, the National Secretary of Interior standards, um, uh, with some modifications, a little less heavy-handed in some language. For you know, we use words like recommended rather than must. You know. But um, essentially, they're they're modeled after the uh, the National Secretary of Interior standards. They're not technical. They're not prescriptive but they're intended to promote responsible preservation practices uh, by, by sort of talking about a philosophical consistency to the work. Um, there's basically four sort of treatment categories that 
exist in the National uh, Secretary of the Interior standards. The most um, restrictive, maybe, uh, but the the one that uh, you should always strive to uh, um, achieve, if at all possible, is, is the preservation uh, standard, which is a retention of all of the historic fabric through conservation, maintenance, and repair. Sort of what I was talking about before in terms of replacing the windows and, and doors. You try to save as much of that historic fabric as is possible. The next sort of hierarchy, next sort of uh, treatment category in the hierarchy, if you will, is rehabilitation, and this emphasizes the retention and repair of historic materials. Um, but um, there's more latitude provided for replacement because it, it assumes that the property is more deteriorated. It's going to require more intervention. Um, but both preservation and rehabilitation standards focus attention on the preservation of existing materials to the greatest extent. Spatial relationships, you know, we talk about sort of the form of buildings being an important consideration, as well as uh, materials and finishes and the overall design. It's, it's, it's those things that give the property its historic character. The next sort of treatment in the hierarchy is restoration. Uh, and restoration is really um, focuses on the retention of materials from the most significant time in, in a building's history uh, and, and, a, and it allows for removal of subsequent uh, period uh, additions and, and additions of materials. So it sort of goes back to what the, what the, you know, the original structure was. And then finally, reconstruction. Um, sort of be in the lowest of the hierarchy of, of treatment categories because here you're talking about sort of recreating history and I mentioned that's not really an appropriate thing from a preservation point of view but there are cases where recreating a non-surviving site or a landscape or even a structure um, but all you know constructed with all new materials to replicate um, Choosing the most appropriate treatment of those four uh, for a building requires, you know, careful decision making about a building's historical significance. How important is this building? Uh, and one of the things that uh, uh, the city did back in the 70s and the 80s was to um, contract with a, uh, a group who conducted a survey of properties around, throughout the city and they rank those, those historic properties uh, in categories. A category one building being the most significant architectural uh, structure. Some of the churches, in fact, being good examples of category one buildings. You'll hear, you'll hear that term, it's a category one, it's a category two. Uh, but category one being the most significant, category four being the least significant, but significant in its own right in that it's actually rated as many buildings Actually, most buildings in the city are not rated uh, in this survey. Um, additionally, uh, the Sanborn Fire Insurance uh, Company back in the uh, late 19th century began doing surveys of properties uh, and, and listing uh, sort of, they, they actually uh, prepared drawings that show the form of the building, um, the additional features, a lot of features really, a lot of descriptive information about the building, whether it had a piazza, what the mailing systems were, what the materials were, what the roof was. We use these uh, documents now, and they were, they were updated at several periods of time um, in, uh, in the course of this century, or the or last century, I should say. Um, and we use those as one of our tools to determine Holds this building and what has happened to this building as it's evolved over time. Um, so, you know, the important uh, uh, decisions in determining which treatment category are the relevant, uh, relative importance of building in history. Uh, nationally, National Historic Landmarks, uh, buildings that are individually listed on the National Register often mark 
preservation or restoration, the two most extreme uh, or restrictive, I should say, categories. And then buildings that contribute to a district but are not individually listed on the National Registry uh, more frequently undergo rehabilitation than, say, restoration. Um, the physical condition of the building. Um, preservation, you know, the most re uh, restrictive category may be appropriate if distinctive materials, features, and spaces are attacked. And I'll show you some images, examples of this. Um, rehabilitation, it's usually the most appropriate um, if extensive repair and replacement are needed. As I mentioned earlier, the condition of the building, if it's deteriorated, may require more intervention than, say, uh, preservation. Um, the use of the building, you know, this is nothing related to BAR, because BAR has no uh, purview over the use of the building. That's, that's a zoning issue. But many historic buildings can be accepted for new uses, uh, what we call adaptive reuse, um, without damaging the historic character. And I'll show you an example of, of an adaptive reuse in the city of Charleston, for instance. Um, and then mandated code requirements. Um, they have to be taken into consideration, and if changes to the building are made to comply with uh, code requirements, if they're not done well, they can really uh, adversely affect the, the quality and the character, the historic character of the building. Um, materials are critically important. The building code does allow uh, for existing buildings. There is an allowance in the, existing, in the building code for existing buildings. So there's some consideration given to historic buildings as part of the building code. You can do some things that you couldn't do on new buildings, but generally the guiding principle is whatever you're doing with the new must be code compliant. If you're retaining some existing features that are not code compliant, they can remain non-code. New constructions obviously should be designed to minimize the loss of historic materials and, and the changes to the you know overall form of the building. Um, the Secretary of the Interior Standards, by the way, you can find those on the National Park Service's website, nps.gov. Uh, they also uh, put out a, a series of technical briefs. So if you have technical issues with windows and uh, painting and, and masonry work and roofing, you can find technical briefs that will guide you in what the appropriate thing to do for your particular issue. Um, but um, a property will be used as it was historically or be given a new use that requires minimal change to it. These are, by the way, these are the standards. The eight, the eight uh, standards that I'll go through are the Secretary of the Interior standards. Um, so the first standard talks about uh, using what was historic, even if it's an adaptive reuse. And this is the, the uh, Wolf Street Theater on Wolf Street. You know, this building was adaptively reused as a theater, but they did a very sensitive um, adaptation of the building and retained as much of the original historic fabric as, as possible uh, while adapting the use of the building. The historic character of a property will be retained and preserved. Removal of distinctive materials or alteration of features, spaces, and spatial relationships that characterize the property will be avoided. Here's an example of somebody, you know, typical single house in Charleston with a full depth uh, piazza porch. Uh, you see this oftentimes, it got infilled at some point in time, adversely affected the historic character of the building and, and the form of the building. Uh, you can also see the impact right here at what we call the piazza screen. Uh, you see these you know, throughout the city where you have a door that enters on. This was modified. Oftentimes you see them adding brick to the facade of these. They were, they were not brick originally in most cases. Uh, so you got to be careful about what you do to these historic buildings, not only in terms of materials and historic fabric, but, but the form of the building as well. Uh, third standard, each property will be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. So changes that create a false sense of historical development, such as adding conjectural features or elements, 
uh, from other historic properties should not be undertaken. This is an example of, um, we had an applicant come in, this is a yellow brick building. It is a um, you know, early uh, 20th century building, um, battery, and they wanted to stucco the, over the brick. They didn't like the color of the brick. Completely inappropriate. There's no way to stucco over this building and respect these these uh, cast lintels, um, these coins at the corner. Uh, it just wouldn't work. You couldn't put the proper thickness of stucco on the building and, and have it work uh, with some of the architectural details on the building. Um, the fourth standard changes to a property that have acquired historic significance in their own right will be retained and preserved. That means that if a historic building has evolved over time and, and additional features have been added, say in the 19th century, they now have historic significance as well. This is the Claude Plantation, and an example, this used to be the back of the building, um, but it evolved into the front of the building, and this, this um, lady in the window and entry was added at some point in time, it now has historical significance in its own right. Distinctive materials, features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a property will be preserved. Here's a case where the homeowner um, of this house wanted to replace these distinctive sawn balusters on the, uh, on the piazza with simple you know, two by two square balusters completely inappropriate. This is what we call a character defining feature of this building. And that particular aspect of, of the, uh, the work was, was discouraged and in fact denied by the board. Um, deteriorated historic features will be repaired, as I mentioned, rather than replaced. And if it's severely deteriorated and requires replacement, uh, the new feature will match the old design in, in as much as, as is possible. Uh, this is an example of a house that had a permit for lot repairs. And this is something we're working to get more specific to define. Uh, I've actually started requiring people to bring in photographs of the building and, and we sit down and we identify. And if I have to go out and, and field look at it with them, I'll do that and, and identify exactly which areas of siding and balusters and columns and roofing windows are going to be replaced if they need to be. Because to simply say you've got a permit for a lot of repairs is too long and then you wind up with people taking every stitch of siding off the building, replacing the windows with inappropriate windows, using framing lumber for, for casing, trim, and so forth. So a really a, a great number of things here that are inappropriate. Um, and then chemical or physical treatments you know, ways of removing paint and coatings from buildings, uh, if appropriate, will be undertaken using the gentlest means possible. Some of the technical briefs uh, from the uh, National Park Service deal with these types of issues very effectively. Both these buildings suffered extensive damage um, from removal. In this case, it was sandblasting these stone columns. In this case, it was removing stucco that essentially, uh, you know, you, you may have heard there are two types of stucco. There's line-based stucco, which is the, the type of stucco that's used in historic buildings uh, you know, back in earlier times. And then Portland cement stucco, which is a 20th century invention, a much harder material, a very durable material. But when you put Portland cement over a historic brick and you ever try to take it off, this is what you get. A lot of damage to historic brick. And once you do that, the brick no longer functions the way it was intended, originally intended to, and it's not as waterproof as it was originally intended to be. Uh, so um, the last standard is archaeological resources will be protected and preserved in place, and if such resources must be disturbed, mitigation measures will be undertaken. Um, this is Fort Pemberton. Civil War Battery, um, that's another of our landmark sites. Um, and in 2008, um, 
the preservation plan recommended adopting an ordinance to protect archaeological sites, uh, which currently Charleston has no laws on the books regarding underground resources, so it's, it's something we're working on. Um, and so I would encourage anyone who is contemplating undertaking a project to start building, come in and meet with us. We're very willing to do that, come out and meet with you at your site. Um, this is some, some contact information. I've got cards with me if anybody would like them. We're located at 75 Calhoun Street on the, on the third floor. Um, just send me an email or give me a call and we can arrange an appointment. Or you can come into the, the, uh, the office and meet with one of my staff at the counter if you have a, a simple question that needs to be dealt with, a simple approval that can be done by the staff at the counter. And I'll open it to uh, any questions that you want to have. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you know, this is something that um, the National Park Service has worked diligently on in the last couple of years to try to marry sustainability with preservation because, as you know, oftentimes there's a conflict there. Storm windows being the most obvious, or energy efficient windows. We get people all the time on historic properties building and place windows with energy efficient windows. It's just not the appropriate thing to do. So there is, there is, we have a Department of Sustainability in the city as part of our, part of our department actually, um, and we're working to try to update our standards with regard to sustainability and work in concert with what the National Park Service is promoting and recommending. Just wondering, do you go around the really about the approval process. And, you know, I, I see our department as not so much a regulatory body as, as really we exist to try to help people get through this process. 